My name is Lisa Kaltenegger. I'm the director of the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell and a professor in the astronomy department. We have found thousands of other worlds out there, and some of them might just be like our own. And that's what I work on, how to spot if they are, and also how to tell the difference whether there's really life on them or not. Because we, for the first time in human history, have developed the technology to figure that out. I think all scientists are curious by nature. And what we get to do is actually live that curiosity in day-to-day -day life and ask questions that don't have an answer yet. So that's what brought me to my job, because I want to figure out how things work, and especially in my case, whether or not we are alone in the universe. We already now, for some of these big worlds, bigger than Jupiter or Jupiter's size, actually can spot the chemical makeup of the atmosphere. But our telescopes are not big enough yet to also spot these small planets and have a look at their atmosphere. So we are waiting for the James Webb Space Telescope, the 6.5 meter huge telescope we're going to put into space, the follow-up of Hubble and so far, and on the ground, the European Extremely Large Telescope, the 40 meter telescope in Chile, because those telescopes for the first time will be able to spot those small worlds like our and get a glimpse at what their air is made of. So if you find a world that's orbiting another star, the first question you ask is, how far away is it? Because that's what we get from the data. And so if it's not too close to the star where it's not too hot, but also not too far away, so it's not too cold, then it could have warm conditions on the surface for liquid water. But the planet also has to be small enough, about two Earth radii or smaller. So it is rock because you want a rock at a nice warm distance from the star. So it could have liquid water, one of the base ingredients of life. So that's habitable, and we call it potentially Earth-like, because whether or not it's Earth-like, we'll need the next telescope to figure exactly that out. When we look at those worlds, and now we have dozens who actually, at this right distance, not too hot, not too cold, and small enough to be like the Earth. How could we ever figure out if they really harbor life? And there, we have to go back to the composition of the atmosphere, because our air is modified by life. The oxygen we breathe, for example, is produced by life. CO2 that we breathe out, methane that is produced by life, all of this shapes Earth's atmosphere, and hopefully it will shape other planets' atmosphere. And then, when the light hits the atmosphere from the star, it actually hits those molecules, and some of the light won't make it to my telescope because it hit those molecules and made them swing and rotate. So that light is lost, or the energy is used up. So when I spot that there's less light coming in at a certain color of light, then I know, ooh, it had an oxygen molecule. And so like a passport stamp, the light that gets to me carries the information what it encountered and whether or not some of these molecules were made by life. There's this funny idea that if, and hopefully we will, we would find life in another world, that it could be this panicky reaction, but Honestly, we found the first planet about 20, a little bit more, 23 years ago now in 1995. So we found the first planets, then we found the first planets at right distance, then we found the first planets that could be like Earth. So I think we basically had a little bit of time to get used to the idea that if there are so many Earth-like planets or potentially Earth-like planets out there, I should say potentially because we don't know yet, then maybe just maybe, there could be planets like ours with life out there, and then it doesn't seem so scary because we did the steps. It was not now and then. And if you are scared, these planets, these other stars are 
very, very far away. And traveling is really hard. And the speed of light is probably, as far as we know, the highest speed anybody can ever go. So our closest star after the sun is four light years away. So if you can travel with 10% the speed of light, it still takes you 40 years to get there. So somebody would have to have a real good reason to come and rob something. And water you can find in the universe, other stuff you can find in the universe, you wouldn't have to come all the way to us. So I'm not scared, I'm just really hopeful. And I think most people aren't scared either because we are the discoverers of our time. We find other worlds. And hopefully, we'll find that those also have life. When somebody asks you, what's the chances of life out there in the universe? I really like the answer one of my colleagues, Michel Mayor, the discoverer of the first exoplanet around a sun-like star gave. He said, the chances are 50% plus minus 50. And I completely agree with him on that, because we don't know. That makes the search so fascinating. If the universe is teeming with life and nature makes life wherever she can, we will be in and find it in a couple of years because these telescopes that can find it, the James Webb Space Telescope in 2020, and find it not easily, but incredibly hard at the frontier of technical possibility, but possible. And the European Extremely Large Telescope in Chile is supposed to go online in 2024, so there's only a couple more years. If life evolves everywhere it can, and it leaves signs in the air that we can spot, then we're in for a treat, because I for once would love to live at the time in human history where we figured out whether or not we're alone in the universe. One of the questions that of course comes up is like, would life be the same now on the earth? And I find that it's in a way funny because if I look at life in the depths of the sea and all these creatures we're discovering, I would have never imagined anything like that. And that's our own planet, our own evolution. So I think we're gonna be in for surprises, but I honestly don't think that I can imagine the fascinating diversity that if life exists, Mother Nature will have made out there. When first this idea about finding life on other planets was seriously thought about by astronomers, they set up this equation, or Frank Drake is uh, the person who set up this equation, the Drake equation, that said how many civilizations would be out there in the cosmos, really or in our galaxy, it depends on how you want to look at it. And I said, well, it depends on the stars that are out there, how many of those form planets, how many of those planets develop life, how many of those develop intelligent life, because they really wanted a signal from a technology uh, civilization. So they wanted a radio signal. So how much of the intelligent life, how many of those actually make radio telescopes and send signals? What we're now thinking about it is a little bit different. So we say, maybe they don't send signal, maybe they don't have radio telescopes, but how many of those planets develop life is one of the huge questions left, because we know one out of five stars have a planet that could be like the Earth. But there's the Fermi paradox that goes with the Drake equation that says, then where is everyone? If there's so many suns out there and there's so many planets, why isn't anyone there? And there's lots of answers. And one of them is, well, what about if the lifetime of a civilization that could go to travel the stars is really short because they kill each other off with nuclear explosions or other things? And I hope that's not the right answer why there's nobody out there. But I actually think, and I usually post that question to the students I teach, undergrads. I say, well, if I have the money and the means to go to one planet, and there's many, many out there, and one is 5,000 years older than us, and one is 5,000 years younger than us. Which one do you want me to pick? And most of my students, and I personally, would take the one that's further along to figure out what's going to be in the future. And honestly, our planet, as amazing as it is, and I wouldn't want to trade it for anything, we are not that interesting yet.
we've only made it to the moon. So why would anybody who had a choice and could travel pick us? I think they'd wait a little bit more before they'd pick us. But that's, of course, the positive interpretation of the Drake equation. But I hope that's a better answer. And this whole annihilation thing that intelligent species do is not the real 